So let's, let's get a little bit of a, a bird's eye view of the Torah itself. <clears throat> it's broken into five books. And you have to wonder why. So if we look at just the titles, the names of the five books, we get to, we get to see an interesting thing. In English, or Latin, or Greek, or whatever it is, the first book of Torah is called Genesis. But Genesis means the beginning, the origins. The word Bereshis, the Hebrew name for, for the book, Bereshis, in the beginning, emphasizes that it is not the beginning. It's early on, but it is not the beginning. So that translation is a bit misleading. In the beginning means that the plan itself, the origins of the world, is a plan, not an act of creation. So before you actually do creation, you first have to have a vision, a blueprint, a plan. And it's the, it's the vision that, create, that is the beginning of creation. And early on in that vision, God said, let there be light. But saying, let there be light, or even creating the earth, that's not the beginning. It doesn't start with creation. I mean, if, literally, it starts with creator, not with creation. So where does creation happen within God? When he actually creates? No, it must, it must have its origins in a more embryonic state. So the real origin, the real beginning, the true genesis of creation is God's desire, which produced a plan, which produced a vision, which produced uh, the actual making of the world. So there's one plan, and that is God wants a dwelling place in the lowest world. That was the vision, that you create all the worlds down to the lowest where you can go no further, and then elevate that to become one with him and complete the circle and everything becomes one. So ultimately, God is about oneness. Now, the first project in, in, uh, in any true creation, or the first, uh, the first step in any project, is who you're working with. Who are you working with? God's plan is that the world should become a dwelling place for him. Well, who's going to do it? What's your cast of characters? Who's your staff? The first book of, of, the, of the Torah is just cast of characters. That's what it is. It introduces you to, to Adam and Chava, to Noyach, to Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and they go down to Egypt, and that's where it ends. So basically what we're told is there is a people, there's a chain, it starts with, with, um, with Avraham, it... it uh, it finishes with the tribes, the 12 tribes who make up the Jewish people. Now you know who is responsible for making the world a dwelling place for God. End of project one. And so the book ends. The next book is really the next project. What's the next step? Now what? You know who's going to do it? What do, you, what do you need to know now? The next step is where? Location. Where is this dwelling place going to be? In the lowest world, but in what, in what part of the lowest world? Where, where in the lowest world? Some people feel, some religions believe, God exists in your mind, in your heart, in your faith, in your higher faculties. He's experienced only as 
a religious experience, as a, as a spiritual event. The physical world is the enemy. It encumbers you, it, it limits you, it, dra it drags you into all sorts of unholy stuff. God is not there. If you want God, you sit on a mountaintop, you meditate, and you find God. The second book of Torah says, that's not where it happens. <clears throat> huh? Because the second book of Torah primarily describes the, constr the construction of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle, in painstaking detail. Mm -hmm. Made out of wood, made out of gold, made out of copper, you make it this size, a cubit, a cubit and a half. <laughs> very physical, very physical stuff. And that's where God dwells. This is his tabernacle, his meeting place. <clears throat> the rest of the book, of the second book, <laughs> is... Um, Practical laws, uh, civil, social necessities, how, how to run a civilized society. There's nothing mystical in this book. And even the event at Sinai, God comes down and speaks to the people, that's kind of mystical. But the emphasis is... God came down. We didn't go up. God came down to Mount Sinai. The whole emphasis of this book is focus on the lowest, the most physical, the most material part of the world. That's where God is going to dwell. You make tefillin out of leather, not out of good intentions. You make matzah out of flour, not out of faith. <laughs> Not out of faith. <clears throat> and that's why the name, in, again, in Latin it's called Exodus. Why? Because one of the stories, or maybe the first story, in the book is about the Exodus. All right. If you were going to name it after some significant event, it should be called Mount Sinai. Because the whole point of the Exodus was to get to Mount Sinai and receive the Ten Commandments. So the book should be called Sinai. Ten Commandments. But the name of the book is not just the name of this Parsha. It's the whole book. In Hebrew, the name of the second book is Shmos, which means names. Now, that's a strange title, because the, the book begins with a, an account of who was in Egypt and who were the children, and who, the names of the children of Israel. Names are given when the soul comes down into a body. Souls in heaven have no names. In fact, when, you, when uh, Jacob was wrestling with the angel and he said, what's your name? And he said, well, what are you asking? We don't have names. We don't go by names up in heaven. So the souls that are even greater and higher than angels certainly don't have names. The name is useful when the soul comes into a body and, and you need to connect the soul to the body. There needs to be some channel of flow of energy and of communication between the soul and the body. The name facilitates that connection. And that's why um, when a person needs a blessing for health, you, uh, the blessing, the Mishaberach, is made with the name and the mother's name. The name is your channel for, for connection to your soul. So what does this mean? The second book of Torah is about names. It's not about souls in heaven. It's about souls when they come down into a body which is when names become relevant. So briefly, the whole book of Shmos, which is the second book, is about where. Where? In your home, in your, in your possessions, in your physical life, in your physical activities, in your food. So when people say, 
Isn't that strange that God has commandments concerning food, concerning your bed, concerning your, your clothes, concerning your, uh, your field and your, and your scales at, 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 at work? Shouldn't we better not eat, not have work shops, not make money, live on a mountaintop and disavow all physical, material, no, the exact opposite. When our physical stuff becomes permeated with godliness, now we're fulfilling the whole purpose of creation. We get to the third book, we don't have to go into that. The third book is how. All right, we know who, we know where, now how. The third book of Torah is all about sacrifices. That's why it's called Leviticus. It's the job of the Le tribe of Levi to be the, uh, to be the priests and the Koyan and perform the sacrifices. A sacrifice means literally you take a goat or a, or, a, or a lamb, you bring it to the temple, you put it up on the, on the Mizbeach, on the altar, and, and it rises and is consumed by the divine fire. You actually see the physical become spiritual or godly. So it's the how. How do you elevate an ordinary goat and turn it into something holy? The fourth book, very briefly, is called Desert. In the Desert. In English, it's called Numbers. Again, it's not a good translation. In the Desert, the fourth book is about when. So the first book is who, the second book is where, the third book is how, the fourth book is when. Because, we, you know, we've got to have like a up, an, up, uh, an update, a report on how are we doing. Is the world getting any holier? Are we, are we succeeding at all? Very often, well, for most of our history, the world looked like a desert. Nothing's growing. Nothing's happening. We're not making any progress. Here we thought, just as an example, after the Holocaust, there would never be anti-Semitism again. <laughs> right. So it's a desert. It's not getting any better. Or so it seems on the surface. The fourth book of Torah says, even when things look like they're deserts, nothing's growing, it's desolate, it's... Underneath, we're making progress. Every day we're getting closer. It keeps moving, it keeps building and accumulating. The bad stuff, the bad stuff burns off after a time. The good <coughs> lasts forever. Then the fifth book is the conclusion. When we're ready to enter the promised land. In other words, before Mashiach comes, when, when the plan has been completed, and then we move up to how do you live in a perfected and, uh, and completed world? So basically what, what, it, what it's saying is, there's one Torah, not five Torahs. There's one Torah because there's one plan, there's one vision, there's one desire that God has. And it comes in five stages, in five volumes. 